Hello, I'm Tyler Schreckenwells, and this is our project. We are the remote control USAF C-130. I am a senior electrical engineering student. I am a traditional option as well. So the opportunity statement we wanted to have was to give hobbyists a reliable uh, remote control airplane that replicates real life aspects of an aircraft and also give the user more functionality within the airplane. <clears throat> the things that the hobbyists wanted to see in this remote control airplane after discussing it with them is their main concern was increased flight time. With most DC, uh, well, electric RC airplanes, their flight, flying time is roughly five, five to six minutes before they have to land and recharge. So that was their first uh, important want. The second one was wooden RC airplanes has been pretty much eliminated in today's hobbyists. So they wanted to see an aircraft designed out of foam. And then the third one, most hobbyists do not enjoy anymore building actual aircraft from scratch. They want to buy a kit online and have it almost ready to fly. So you just throw a couple pieces together and it's ready to go. Here is our design of our C-130 through uh, Fusion 360. As you can see, there is our four motors, which are replicated by uh, four DC motors with eight by six uh, props attached to it. We have our aileron flight surfaces, our rudder flight surfaces, and our elevator flight surfaces, which replicate the, the three main flight control surfaces of an aircraft. To, to implement a, a longer flying time, our group decided to use the floor panel layout on top of the, on top of the wings, as you can see right here. So with this floor panel layout, there is three sets of four solar cells. One set of four solar cells is uh, wired in series, then the other four is wired in series, and the other four is wired in series. This would give each set of four a total voltage of two volts and a total amperage of four amps. The way the solar, solar panels work is, if you wire them in series, voltage will increase, current will stay the same. If you wire them in uh, parallel, uh, voltage will stay the same and current will increase. So when we had three sets of two volt, four amp uh, solar cells, we then wound them in parallel to make it two volt, 12 amp to increase the amperage going into our batteries. When we were doing the testing of our batteries, we had five tests. The first test we got 1.3 volts out of the two possible volts it created which gave us a 65% efficiency. The second test, we got 1.15 volts, which is 57.5% efficiency. Third test, 1.67, which is 83% efficiency. 1.22, which is 61%, and 1.52, which is 76%. This is all varying on where you tested it, indoors or outdoors, and the amount of uh, lighting coming out of the, the room. My name is Annie Reese. I am an electrical engineering student and I am a traditional option. One of the key concepts that we implemented in our design was the redundancy system. The, way, the reason we implemented this was because in a real aircraft, if for whatever reason your engines were to fail, you would be crashing your plane and there's no way to really land safely. So what we did, we implemented the use of a second battery and we used an Arduino and a relay to switch between the two. And with the Arduino, the max voltage that you could send through is only about five volts. Now the batteries that we were using are 14.8. So in order to safely switch, we had to use a voltage divider to scale down the voltage seen by the Arduino, make a reading, what's the battery voltage, and if it was lower than 10.5 volts, which I'll explain why that voltage in just a second, it would initiate the relay to switch between the two batteries. The reason that we made it switch at 10.5 volts was based on our ground testing. We ground tested the motors to see, okay, how long, this is how long we could run it, 
and then we checked the battery voltage with a multimeter once the motors slowed down to a speed that was no longer suitable for flying the plane. And the picture on the right there is just a simulation of the voltage divider scaling down the voltage from 14.8 down to the 1.35 volts seen by the Arduino. And then it might be a little bit hard to read, but I'm just going to walk you through the code real quick. Um, the code is set up so that it takes 10 samples of the voltage, and the reason it takes 10 samples is just because in case if you were to read it at the exact moment there would be a voltage spike, it just would calculate the average instead, so you're, not, so you're just getting a more accurate reading. And then if you go to a couple of lines down, you're just setting the relay, because relays are active low instead of active high. So you just set it up so the relay is inactive first, then put it through a continuous loop so the Arduino is just doing this over and over, and it will read the voltage of our battery, calculate the average, and since it's an analog value, it's, there's a little bit of an ADC conversion. And then the next page, the bottom part just describes it's making the reading. Is it lower than 10.5 volts? And if so, it'll initiate the relay to switch and over to the second power source. And if it's greater than 10.5, nothing will happen. It'll just continue running as normal. So, hello, my name is Jacob Henry. Uh, I'm a traditional option logical engineering student here. And for our manufacturing process, we worked with Vista AST, who owned the Inventor Cloud 3D printer system. Um, and what, what they do what they do is they're a uh, rapid prototyping uh, firm. So not only do they help with education, but they work with rapid prototyping technologies such as laser cutters and 3D printers to help them create new products, more for educational purposes, but th that's a uh, divergent topic. So, what we used um, originally um, for our first iteration of the design, we were thinking about using interlock slices after we developed the uh, previous 3D model here. We were thinking about developing the majority, or at least the, the, the wing, through the use of interlock slices, which is a method where we take cross sections spaced out um, evenly over, um, over a certain axis, and then we take another cross section to act as the, the support beams throughout um, the rest of the body that we are working with. What we ended up going with, though, was a stacked slice method. What that means is just purely taking one type of slice and stacking them together to create the majority of the body that we were going to create. Over here is um, what we ended up putting together. And this is how it looks in the program. And how we did this was we used a laser cutter and we ended up using a insulation foam. Uh, we were originally trying to use a very different foam that was of a denser quality that would, we felt would have been more effective, but we will be getting into that later. So since we were building an airplane out of foam, we didn't really have many opportunities to test fly this aircraft because if you crashed the airplane, you would have no remains and we did not have enough time to rebuild another one in a 13 week period. So we did a lot of component testing on the ground, so to speak. So what we would do is wire all the servos and motors to the receiver transmitter and then run them through a series of tests. We would, make, we would run the servo testing by making sure that the servos gave the full range of operation for the intended flight control surface. So the one test would be the aileron test. We would connect the two aileron servos and make sure when the transmitter said to turn right, that the right aileron would go up and the left aileron would go down. And then for the elevator, we would make sure that both of the servos would go up at the same time and down at the same time. And with the rudder, we just made sure that it had a complete right and left uh, movement along with it. For the motors, on the other hand, we didn't test them on the aircraft. We, uh, we drilled them to, well, we screwed them to a board and mounted the board to 
a table to do our testing. Our first test was both batteries connected and 50% power applied to the, the motors. This test surprisingly lasted over an hour before we ended the test. Our next test, we decided to run the motors at 100% power, and, and we got a final duration of 10.2 minutes, which was theoretically close to what we envisioned. Our third test, we ran again at 100%, and we got a 12.1 uh, minute duration. We only ran three tests of the motors because during our third test, we had a catastrophic mechanical failure, and the mounts that were mounted to the, the motors cracked. So we didn't run any further testing because we were afraid if we kept testing, we wouldn't have a, a motor to put onto the airplane for the final flight. Right, for our timeline, as you can see, like the green represents things that were done on time, and the red indicates things where we got a little behind. As you can see, we got a little bit behind mainly in just ordering our parts and getting them in on time. And that kind of just let us play catch up through the rest of the semester. And it just set behind our manufacturing and actually actual assembly of the aircraft itself. Most of our expenses, as the group before us mentioned, we had a $300 budget from the electrical engineering department here at YSU. And of that, we spent $297.37. So just a couple dollars left over. But the biggest expense that we made was actually just the batteries. Two of them at $55 a piece, roughly, was approximately a third of our budget was spent just on the batteries themselves. Here is a demo video of the ground testing. Here you can see the ailerons moving in opposite directions. Then we will move back to the elevator where you can see them moving in the same direction. And then you can see the rudder having full range of operation. And then we did a simple engine start. As you can see right here, this engine is wobbly. That is the one that had the catastrophic failure. Uh, one of the, a piece in the internal of the motor broke off during the test, so it wobbled and created a lot of vibrations throughout the uh, test. And the engine on the far right wasn't working because it had a, del a delayed response time. So what you'd have to do is you'd have to start the three engines, cut them back down to off, and then start them all four again, and the fourth one would kick on. Now here is the video of our airplane trying to fly. We started bringing it up gradually, and we ended up taking it up almost to, I don't know, we did take it up to completely full speed, and by that point, we weren't noticing any lift. We were moving into wind, hopefully trying to increase our uh, lift, and as you can see, it acted more like a penguin than a pelican. So. <laughs> so. <coughs> when we were carrying the airplane to the actual testing field, we noticed a lot of lift being generated just by the wind blowing. So we were assuming that if our landing gear system would have worked and we could have built up enough ground speed prior to takeoff, we might have had a more successful attempt at flying. In the future, there is a lot of problems that need to be addressed, obviously, because we did not have a successful flight. One of the main problems we think needs, that needs to be redesigned is the actual aircraft structure. And in this project, we used pine uh, dowel rods. And with the amount of surface area that our wings encompassed, they just began to sag too much, which caused some torquing in our wings. And we... So we felt that aluminum piping might be another way to do that. The same quarter inch pipe that we were thinking of using, because aluminum is light, um, it's cheap, and we're we would anticipate a lot less likely to warp. Um, and possibly revisiting interlock slicing, really rethinking how about how we would do the mounting of the motors through possible 3D printing of a part to attach to those interlock slices and then covering that with 
uh, I believe the term is ultra coat, the yeah. um, material that we would go over and take a heat gun. Um, also, we would probably enhance the landing gear structure through 3D printing, and both of the both the interlock slices and the uh, landing gear themselves. I've had experience developing uh, plastic parts that are able to be used in conjunction with rubber parts, but um, we got a little behind in a few things, so we weren't able to reach those things. Um, also, using different adhesive for the foam boards. One thing that we noticed was when we used the Loctite uh, adhesive, it worked really great for about a week, and then suddenly, for whatever reason, I think basic weathering or moisture in the air, it's hard to say, um, certain areas that were held started to uh, separate over time, and it was something we personally we're not anticipating. Also, the foam board that we used, um, we went off of a suggestion from one of our hobbyists uh, that, we, that we spoke with, which was using uh, Home Depot insulation foam, since our original foam that we ordered did not come on time. Uh, actually, it didn't come at all because the- uh, They back they, ordered they, it. Yeah, they back ordered it and it got stuck in Oregon. So that was a nice, huge flaw for our design. Um, and the foam that we were going to be using is denser, same, uh, same uh, lightness, but would have been a lot more uh, structurally sound. I certainly feel that, and that foam was more accurate. It was ten mi millimeter slices. Yeah, which was our original design, and now the, when we're working with the half inch uh, uh, board that we used, we found this tolerance issues. So it was not exactly the half inch, and then that us to have to go back and sort of um, do even more redesigning. So we were kind of uh, fighting forces against us throughout the whole process on that. So. In conclusion, this was a great learning experience for us and yeah. we have actually talked about it and we want to continue redesigning this airplane and hopefully get it working prototype here soon. Yeah. We think we need some help from some mechanical engineers to help with some of the mechanical systems. We personally feel that this would be the perfect interdisciplinary project to work because it incorporates electrical systems and obviously taking mechanical structure and flying in the air. Any questions? and it didn't work, I am bound to determined to get it to work. So he's going to be working in Akron and uh, First Energy and we were planning on actually taking this project over the summer personally and uh, continuing finding a better way to approach this. Just because we, we put in a lot of work and we got pretty passionate about it regardless of how it ended up, we wanted to continue and try to do our best to make it better regardless of whether it's for a great or not. And later so. in the project we found out that there's a local hobbyist that makes fiberglass molds of C-130s, yeah. and that would remedy a lot of the structural issues that we have, so I've been trying to get in contact with him to see what it would cost to get one of those fiberglass molds so we can propel this into be a real life C-130 scaled down. When, when you were planning on this I've been planning this idea for years. I, ever since I joined the Air Force, I honestly wanted to uh, build my own airplane. So I had the idea a long time ago, and it kind of came to fruition that, uh, this past semester when me we, and we were late to the fun. Talk. We joined up on this this past semester. So yeah, we talked about it during last semester, so. and then made it happen this semester. Give them once they clap.